Welcome to this session, the September session of the Surface Navy Association's Continuing the Conversation. And we're very excited to have the guests that we have on board with us today. Uh, first, a, a word about the SNA, Surface Navy Association. It is a nonprofit association dedicated to supporting the sea services, uh, Navy and Coast Guard. It's a great organization. I highly recommend it. Huge, huge help for our active duty sailors and Coast Guardsmen in their professional development. So there's an emphasis on that. And that probably differentiates it from uh, some of the other organizations that also do this. So I'm really excited to be a part of SNA. So please check us out at www.navysna.org. Uh, so we're a little late getting started here, so I wanna move fast but I want to introduce our co-host, Master Chief of the Coast Guard, number eight, Vince Patton. He's one of my mentors. Primarily, he's gotten me in trouble my entire, uh, my entire career and after my career, but he's a great guy, and thank you, Vince, for joining us. Thank I'd you also for like me. to introduce, and I'm very honored to introduce our panel guest, uh, Admiral Thad Allen, Commandant, 23rd Commandant of the U.S. Coast Guard. He led the federal response to Hurricanes Katrina and Rita, and he later uh, also led the response to the Gulf of Mexico Deepwater Horizon oil spill in 2010. So he is, uh, some term him, the master of disaster, I, uh, maybe mostly his family, but I, <laughs> that some of these are just kidding folks. I know him well, so don't, don't be too upset. Uh, we also have Rear Admiral, Sinclair Harris, and he's no, no stranger to disaster response either. Navy Rear Admiral Sinclair Harris commanded the Iwo Jima strike force during Hurricanes Katrina and Rita, and he later commanded a strike group providing disaster relief during the 2010 Pakistani floods. The Iwo Jima moored in New Orleans during Katrina and provided command and control for the entire response. Uh, one uh, to the audience that are looking at uh, live on Facebook. If you have questions, please put your questions in the uh, discussion section and uh, we will pick them up and we'll ask them live. So Vince, I think you're going to ask the first question. All right. Well, thanks, Skip. And uh, again, uh, uh, hello, everybody. And uh, Admirals, it's great to be with you both. So the first question that really goes out to both of you and, uh, uh, I, and I'll start with Admiral Allen to answer first and and, uh, and then Admiral Harris to follow on. Or let's do it the other way around. Let's go with Admiral Harris first, and then we'll have Admiral Allen to follow. So this question came from Captain Rob Smith, U.S. Coast Guard retired. We continue to see hurricanes impact the same region impacted by Katrina. Are there lessons learned that were never addressed or implemented? If so, why? And what can we do about it? Well, uh, thank you uh, very much, Skip Vince. Uh, it's an honor to be here again with uh, my shipmate, uh, Commandant Allen, um, just one of my heroes, quite frankly, in, in my history in the Navy. Um, so the question of while we see uh, natural disasters impacting our coasts from the steady increase in climatic events, and we see like this year, we ran out of names and had to go to Greek alphabets. Um, and uh, this morning was reporting on the flooding in Houston. Um, we know sea level rise and other things are, are, are impacting people and we're, and we're all living closer to the coast. And, and that's just those events. We're not even talking about the wildfires that have engulfed the West. Um, all these things, uh, quite frankly, requiring DSCA, Defense Support to Civil Authority. Um, so you ask the question, uh, have we learned anything from this? And my answer from where I stand is yes. And, and I say that uh, having done tours in the Joint Staff and seeing a difference in our level of maturity in response uh, at the close of my career than when I was in 06, working way down in the chain of command under Admiral Kilkenny, under Admiral uh, uh, Fitzgerald, Under Admiral uh, uh, Black Nathman, they were my bosses, and, and Robin Bo uh, Ruben Booker, um, that, you know, when we deployed and did our response, I, I will tell you, I did not have a clue. And while that 
may characterize my entire career, I really did not have a clue about DSCA, what it meant, what I was supposed to do, where I was supposed to do it. Um, so I told my commanders uh, on the ships that were going with us, hey, just find the good thing to do and do it. And let me know what you've done uh, so I can and cover you. And, and most of my SEALs said, that was the best orders I ever gotten. Um, so I think that we've done more training. Uh, I think that uh, FEMA is better prepared as near as I can tell. Um, but the number of these disasters continue to go up the impact they have on our American society continues to grow. Um, so I think that there, there's a continuous learning uh, on it. And I hope that the finances are following to address just uh, the amount and the frequency and the impact of all of these. So that's, that's from the, the junior 06 in the staff uh, view of it over. Thank you, sir. Admiral Allen. You're going to have to unmute yourself. Thanks. Great staff work. <laughs> <laughs> let, me let me tell everybody I'm doing this from an F-250 pickup alongside the road in Pennsylvania. My dogs may join us shortly, just a warning. <laughs> um, to drill down on a couple of points that Sink made, um, there were constructive changes made after Katrina in and around in New Orleans. Uh, the, re the main reason the city flooded was the uh, drainage canals where the water that was pumped out of the city went to Lake Pontchartrain were located in, near the center of the city and not out Lake Pontchartrain. So there was no barrier when the water came into the lake and back into the city. And then the levees were overtopped. Uh, there's been a lot of engineering changes that have been made to do that, including moving the pumping stations out to the lakefront and Lake Pontchartrain. Uh, Following the landfall of Katrina and then Rita, what we immediately did, and Sink can comment on this later, uh, rather than going random and seeing who needed to be rescued on rooftops, we shifted to a grid search to make sure we covered an area completely uh, to make sure that somebody that didn't have a radio or a means of communication uh, could be rescued. But in general, with the increase in the number of hurricanes, what we've got with uh, global warming is evaporation out of the ocean. There are huge equivalent of jet streams of vapor flying around the world at high altitudes now and can be deposited sometimes on the other side of the world. We can have evaporation in the Indian Ocean that ultimately produces the rain we saw at Harvey, the Hurricane Harvey in Houston. So I think the, uh, the changes that are happening meteorologically around the world are going to continue to have these events and you may have an event that's entirely a rain event or you can have an event that's a wind event and that will drive storm surge. So it's kind of playing Russian roulette a little bit. If you've seen one hurricane, you've seen one hurricane. There are going to be different nuances to each of them. Uh, but anybody that hasn't got on board with understanding that climate change is impacting our world and the number of these disasters we're dealing with uh, needs to go back to school and learn what's going on. Thank you, sir. Skip. So back in 2005 with Hurricane Katrina, I'll tell you, I watched on the run-up to that, uh, that disaster. I watched the, I was glued to the television like most Americans were uh, as they were going into, uh, what was it, the forts complex? Uh, the, uh, I thought, man, that is the, all those folks in there, this is going to be a terrible thing. So that was one of the most catastrophic disasters to ever impact, I think, mainland United States. It was also coastal Louisiana, Mississippi, and Alabama. So the question for both of you is, and I think we'll start with Admiral Allen on this one. You both had incredible leadership roles uh, in this event. How were you notified, notified about your respective roles? Where were you and uh, what did you initially think and do? Well, I was the sitting chief of staff of the Coast Guard on the 29th of August when the uh, storm came ashore. Uh, through that following week, there were a lot of conversations about what was going on. We had the breakdown of uh, of order in the uh, first the Superdome and then the Convention Center. I was involved in uh, conversations with the Joint Staff and other uh, folks in Washington about what the situation was like. There was actual discussions about whether or not they should waive posse comitatus or invoke uh, the Insurrection Act, but the fact of the matter was we had a standing mayor and a governor and there was no legal uh, premise to usurp their power. So the question was how do you try and solve the problems? Uh, the, the second issue was 
the hurricane was gone in 24 hours. The real problem in New Orleans was the flooding caused by the collapse of the, of the drainage canals and the levees. And when that happened, uh, New Orleans became the equivalent of a victim of a weapon of mass effect, but without any uh, criminality. Uh, throughout that week, I was watching carefully and everybody else was concerned. Uh, on Friday afternoon, I was at a change of command at Group Chincoteague on the eastern shore of the Coast Guard. Uh, Dana Reed, my former aide in uh, the 7th District, was relieving Ron Lebrecht, the outgoing group commander. I got a call from uh, Admiral uh, Tim Sullivan, who was the military assistant to Secretary Chertoff, and they asked me if, uh, if they asked me would I go to New Orleans and see what I could do. After talking with Pam, I felt that maybe there weren't any options. If I got down there, could I really be effective? And we thought that I could be. So I told them that I would. Uh, what happened then was an uh, uh, interim period from Friday to Monday. I didn't hear anything. And then I got a call on Friday morning from Secretary Chertoff uh, asking me if I would proceed to Baton Rouge, talk with uh, uh, Mike Brown, and then head to New Orleans. So uh, for me, it was uh, I was having a sandwich. Okay, uh, at the Second Fleet uh, Commanders Conference, it was lunchtime, uh, and uh, Admiral Fitzgerald was uh, Second Fleet Commander. All of a sudden, I noticed as I was in 06, all the all the admirals in the room, their cell phones were going off and their aides were running around, and I just kept eating my sandwich until I felt this huge paw over my left shoulder uh, from Admiral uh, uh, Fitzgerald. And, and he looks at me and says, sailor, get underway. Uh, I said, spit my sandwich out and run back to the ship uh, to, uh, to get ready. Because we had already kind of got the warning order. Things are going bad uh, or could go bad on the Gulf. Uh, so the Iwo Jima, the Tortuga, and the Shreveport were the three ships that uh, were tentatively assigned uh, for the ready duty ARG at that point in time. Um, and uh, I, I guess they were getting hold of the uh, strike group commander, Kilkenny, uh, and uh, the, uh, the carrier as well. Uh, but uh, basically, I was told, hey, we don't have the firm, you know, marching orders to go, but Fitzgerald said, go. All right. Because uh, he realized the fastest we can travel is uh, about 24 knots downhill with the wind at our back, and not all of us could travel that fast. We had to stop and get the Marines from uh, Camp, uh, from Moorhead City and Camp Lejeune. And right. by the way, we got to get around the corner of Florida, uh, which is no simple task, okay? Uh, as we were traveling down there, I got uh, uh, one email from uh, General Andre, and uh, it had two words in it repeated about five times or six times. ASAP and HUA. Well, I knew what ASAP stood for, but I had no idea what HUA meant because I'm a Navy guy, and I come to find out it meant anything but no. Uh, <laughs> and, uh, and I heard HUA and ASAP a lot uh, during the time we were down there supporting uh, Admiral Allen and uh, General Andre. But uh, it, was, it was pretty sudden. But I, I, my hat goes off to the Second Fleet staff, uh, to the Fleet Forces Command staff at the time and my own uh, team. Uh, the group at uh, ACU, the assault craft unit, uh, because everybody sprang into action to figure out what, what the best mix of capability we could put together quickly uh, that would make a difference. And I think we made some good bets. The team made some good bets on what to bring, bringing up more mic boats and more LC, AC, uh, assault craft unit LCUs, vice all LCAC. Uh, because the entrance way both to the uh, beach in Biloxi was uh, obscured by telephone poles and everything else. It would have ripped the curtains right off the LCAC, and then we would have had nothing. Uh, going up the rivers in Mississippi, we needed those mic boats and those LCUs to, to do some heavy lifting. Uh, so that was how, how I heard about it, and, and we just got underway. Over. Yes, sir. Thanks, Admirals. And uh, just as a follow-up to Admiral Allen, what I was trying to get at, I, or I know early on there was a, quite a lot of criticism leveled at the federal response. And at some point very early on, you took over for Mike Brown. And you had some instructions for the FEMA personnel there in Baton Rouge. Could you tell that story? Because I've always thought that that really gets to the heart of almost any kind of response. Uh, sure, but let me fill in the context a little bit first. Um, because nobody recognized that the problem was uh, – 
New Orleans lost continuity of government that first week. And all the resources that were flowing in were basically self-deployed, reporting back to their own ad cons. And while they're doing a great job and the Coast Guard saved 33,000 people, there was no way to coordinate all this stuff together. Uh, when I got to Baton Rouge on the night of the 5th of September, uh, I stayed overnight. I met with Mike Brown the next morning. and It was clear that uh, he didn't have his arms around this whole problem. So I headed down to New Orleans. And uh, the next three days we spent getting organized. The Iwo Jima was on the dock. We were moored. We were right next to them on the dock. Uh, I got together with Russ Honore, and we uh, made an agreement there would be no air gap between us. Then we brought in the uh, Louisiana National Guard that had been called up from the governor under Title 32. And we had to cooperate with them because there was no official command and control under the Title 32 call-up. Uh, on Friday, I was called to Baton Rouge by Secretary Chertoff. And he called me into a room and he said, there's going to be a news conference in 30 minutes. You're going to relieve Mike Brown of the total response. Until then, I'd been the deputy principal federal official in New Orleans trying to organize what we were doing there. Uh, he called Mike Brown in and told Mike Brown, there's going to be a news conference. Uh, Thad's relieving you and you're going back to D.C. Uh, what followed was the most uncomfortable news conference I've ever been involved in. Uh, and then after it was over, Chertoff left and Mike Brown stormed out. And a week later, uh, he resigned as a FEMA administrator. At that point, I was in a joint field office in Baton Rouge. Uh, there were about 5,000 people in this old Dillard's warehouse. And my aide, uh, Katrina Harper, interesting name, uh, asked me what I should do. And I talked to a female employee as I walked into the building. And she told me how much uh, the response had met to her and how much she was dedicated and how much she was getting out of it. But she says, every time I go back to the hotel room at night, all I see is my leadership and my agency vilified. So I immediately called an all-hands meeting as many people as we could get in a big open space. There were probably about 1,500 people. Uh, I got up on a desk with a loud hailer, and I told everybody I had to go back to New Orleans and make sure everything was being stabilized, and I would be back in 24 hours. And then I looked at the sea of faces, and I had a pretty terrible hangdog look, all of them. And I said, I'm giving you an order. You to treat everybody you come in contact with that's impacted by the storm as if they're a member of your own family your mother, your father, your brother, your sister, so forth. And I said, if you do that, two things will happen. One, if you make a mistake, you're going to err on the side of doing too much. And at this point in the response, I'm okay with that. The other thing is if somebody's got a problem with what you're doing, their problems with me because I told you. At that point, people started openly weeping in the room and there was a collective sigh uh, that changed the barometric pressure in the building. Nobody had ever told these uh, folks in very simple terms uh, what the ethos was we were trying to operate under, what the mission was. Uh, but more importantly, nobody ever told these people that somebody had their back. No, that's, 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 I've always thought that was an amazing point. And uh, I've heard you repeat it many times, but uh, it, I think it gets to the heart of the response. Vince, uh, I think the next question is yours. Okay, well, uh, you know, it's great to have uh, both, both Admiral Sinclair and Admiral Allen here because uh, we're going to talk about jointness. Uh, the fact that uh, uh, for the most part, uh, seeing uh, two services here talk about it. We know there have been multiple services involvement, but uh, uh, can I ask each of you gentlemen to sort of expand a little bit about your involvement with the, uh, the joint services involvement, particularly the Navy uh, Coast Guard, as well as Navy Army, Coast Guard Army, and so forth. So uh, I'll start with Admiral Harris. Okay, so again, as the, the uh, most junior of uh, the folks, in fact, if you look at the organization chart for um, Joint Task Force Katrina, uh, my group, Fibron 4, is nowhere on it. Um, we're that far below the C echelon commander. Um, but when we, and I had never done any of the drills or practices, uh, nor had my group outside of Navy and Marine Corps as a ready duty ARG as a, a group that deployed with the 24th Marine Expeditionary Unit. Um, and, and as I mentioned earlier, what I, when given the order to transit to the Gulf Coast and provide uh, defense support to civil authority, that was about all that was in the order that I can recall from that now. Um, I looked at my COs and said, find the good to do and do it. Um, and I think that jives with what Admiral Allen just got finished saying. Um, so when we get down there, uh, you know, one of the first things is start looking for somebody to give me orders. What do you need? You need medical support. You need birthing support. You need this and you need that. Blah, blah. And we're getting a whole 
get a lot of different things, okay, when we got to the Gulf Coast. But not long after we were there, I think we were there for maybe two days, and we were told to proceed up the Mississippi River, which we were concerned about because the navigation aids uh, we had expected were knocked out. Um, and these are not small ships. Uh, and they're not ships that typically go up rivers. Um, but uh, I'm going to take the Iwo Jima, Rich Callis, one of the best seals I ever, ever served with. Uh, it's going to drive up uh, that. And uh, the Tortuga, I think, was the first one up the river uh, and followed by uh, the uh, Shreveport. And we went to the designated uh, piers that were still available, uh, including Riverwalk, where we uh, served in. Well, I think it was that first day that we pulled in that I met Admiral Allen for the first time. And, uh, and it was pretty simple to me. Sir, what do you need? Okay. And, uh, and he told me. And so I said, okay, well, that, there's my concept of operation. Every day, I'll find Admiral Allen at least twice a day and ask him, sir, what do you need? And then when they got their big van, and you can remember what the name of that van was, y'all parked in the pier. I think it needed power and air conditioning and, and maybe some sandwiches or something. But whatever it was, I said, what do you need? And, and that was my mission as the uh, commander for the C echelon uh, elements uh, to provide. But we also birthed Marines, Army, uh, others from different countries were birthed on, on our ships as well and other first responders. And sir, you, uh, the Iwo Jima also, uh, you used your command and control bridge for much of the response, is that correct? That's affirmative. Uh, the, the landing of Force Elfok, which is the Marines uh, headquarters on the uh, ship, on the Iwo Jima, was used uh, as a coordination center. The Air Force actually took over the uh, air con control area. There was a two star that was on there who was running uh, the air operations because, again, air control was uh, knocked out with the storm. Um, we had all of the uh, General Honore's meetings uh, in the ready room. Uh, so we became a command control center for uh, at least a while until other uh, groups, the, the uh, van that I'm mentioning uh, from the Coast Guard uh, was, uh, had arrived over. So Admiral Allen mentioned a couple times General Honore, and the nation remembers him as a larger than life leader. Uh, personally, uh, I was pretty uh, anxious about that whole response very early on. And when I saw him coming in uh, with the soldiers and, you know, he was, uh, he seemed large and in charge. And uh, I was pretty happy to see him on scene. How did that go, Admiral Allen? Did, uh, how was your relationship with uh, General Honore? Well, what I tell everybody about Russ Honore, I think I told you, Skip, is he may not be right, but he's never in doubt. And the first thing he told his people was, put the weapons down. Uh, we're not here to do policing of our citizens. Uh, he was a local uh, boy from Southern University. Uh, they needed somebody like that down there. Uh, what my job was to do was take what he was responsible for, what I was responsible for, unify the effort, and then do as much good as we could cooperating with each other because we weren't operating under some kind of a statutory authority like Title 10. Uh, plus the Louisiana National Guard was operating under Title 32. So what we in effect did was we used the Iwo Jima as basically as a joint forward operating base. And uh, they were our lily pad as, uh, as Sink has said. Uh, then we moved a, a FEMA van that was in Denton, Texas and it was called Red October. And it had basically uh, all the command and control capability you would need, plus some other communications vans that allowed us to set up planning cells. So what we did was we unified geographically on the pier next to the Iwo Jima, including Homeland Security from New Orleans. And uh, we started doing daily plans. We uh, divided the city into sectors and assigned uh, each one of the sectors to one of Russ Honore's components. For instance, the 82nd Airborne had the Central Business District. We also assigned a sector to the uh, Louisiana National Guard under Lieutenant General Landrin, uh, and they coordinated with us. We didn't have any direct authority, but we made an agreement we were all going to work together. And having joint planning uh, operations twice a day and then briefing the city on what we're going to do the next day, we basically stabilized the operation in 72 hours. It could have been done early if everybody would have understood that the thing that was really impacting New Orleans uh, was their basically lack of capability. They lost their emergency operations center. 
it didn't have the command and control capability to use the resources that were being provided down there. So ultimately we created a joint, uh, actually a joint interagency environment there. It was because it was a coalition of the willing and everybody was there to make sure uh, that we didn't fail. So General Honore had a uh, unique way of handling the press. Uh, can you tell that story or is that one for, uh, for uh, off the air? Uh, well, I, I guess I would have to say which one. Uh, the ones that didn't involve profanity. Uh, <laughs> I guess a, a reporter asked him a question one time. And uh, he said, uh, you look like you're a pretty experienced reporter. Uh, are you like a, a commander reporter? Because if you are, that was a lieutenant question. And he turned and went to the next question didn't answer it. <laughs> so and of course, his, fam his famous uh, phrase was, don't get stuck on stupid. Oh, I remember that. Uh, so let me ask one, one other question real quick here uh, in, in regards to the jointness. Uh, uh, you know, we had, and you mentioned the other services, and uh, Admiral Harris uh, uh, made mention about there were other countries involved. Uh, can, you, can you elaborate about that as well? Yeah, I'll take the first uh, stab at that. Um, we had uh, Mexico sent a pretty large contingent to Mississippi where they were actually uh, went ashore Mexican Seabees. Uh, were helping clear debris and actually help rebuild a, a, a grade school there. Uh, the story I like to tell is that there's an agreement between the can Canada and the U.S. to exchange search and rescue resources when it's needed. We pulled almost every helicopter that wasn't buttoned down in the Coast Guard down to operate in the New Orleans area. And in fact, we vacated the air station at Cape Cod and the Canadians sent a helicopter down and during a, a short period of time actually stood the, the SAR watch in our own country for us. Wow. And just to unpack it a little bit more, um, so there were uh, four Canadian ships that responded uh, to the uh, coalition. Um, there was one from uh, the Netherlands and uh, also uh, one from uh, Mexico. In fact, if you don't mind, uh, Bill, if you can show that uh, PowerPoint slide and go straight to the one uh, with the sailors of uh, Bataan uh, working together with uh, the uh, uh, sailors from the Mexican Navy, and Bill's still there. Um, well, anyway, uh, he'll, he'll show it if he can. Uh, but uh, we, we certainly did have a mix of folks. We had people on the Shreveport from the German dewatering team, as I recall. Um, yeah, go down to that slide number four, um, that were embarked on board uh, our ships. But uh, you, you saw operations like this where you know, our, our close partners and friends uh, from our own hemisphere, Canada and uh, Mexico, who were there working hand in hand with our sales. This is one of my favorite pictures um, uh, during uh, the uh, response. Thanks, thanks, Bill. You know, I would think that this is probably uh, unprecedented, uh, at, at least uh, for a disaster that happened in this country to get multiple countries involved in working uh, at this level. I'm, I don't recall historically if that's ever happened before. Any of you know of that? Well, we've exercised agreements with both Mexico and Canada. We also have agreements with, uh, with the Bahamas and other countries in and around the, uh, the United States, uh, uh, but never on this scale. But if, if you, and if you look at, you know, worldwide, um, the cooperation between militaries for large disasters, you mentioned uh, when I was provided support uh, in Pakistan, actual Admiral Lefevre was our commander. And uh, you had uh, Lieutenant General Mike Nagata uh, working on the northern part of Pakistan. And I was working in the southern part, um, providing response during uh, uh, their disaster, their flood, um, and you had people from every country you can imagine uh, who was uh, flying missions all over Pakistan for that. You remember Japan uh, when uh, they had the earthquake, tsunami, uh, and, and the, that terrible disaster. Uh, that brought a coalition response as well. So we're, uh, unfortunately, un because they're disasters, we're becoming uh, more and more attuned to doing those uh, type of operations. Now the next question is from uh, retired Commander Mike Delury, and he, he asked, this came in on Facebook Live, Admirals, any regrets or issues you would handle differently 
with hindsight. Yeah, thanks, Mike. Uh, <laughs> Mike was the officer in charge at uh, Station New Haven. I think you relieved Skip and was also on the Bollard when I was at Long Island Sound. Great to great to hear from you, Mike. Um, you know, I've been asked a lot, is there anything I would do differently? And, and what I tell everybody was, I wish I would have been there on the 29th of August a week earlier because uh, nobody recognized the fact that uh, they had lost the command and control capability in the city of New Orleans and what resulted in the in the Superdome and the convention center uh, was as a result of their, our failure to understand that they didn't have the capability to use the resources that were being provided. Uh, I guess the only other thing is, and I, we've been paying close attention to us ever since then, is control of the airspace. Uh, with the number of aircraft we had flying around there, uh, it's amazing we didn't have a mid-air collision or, uh, or a near miss. And a lot of that had to do with uh, a, a kind of a pickup game using whatever command, command and control and surveillance ISR you had to try and uh, coordinate what was going on there. Sometimes that was done by orbiting C-130s. The UAG may have some capability, uh, but the, the regular FAA structure in town was down hard. and It required a lot, a lot of uh, effort to try and keep that going. Uh, that ended up being an issue in Haiti when the, uh, the pier collapsed and we had to use the air, the air field to get in. And again, in uh, Deepwater Horizon when we had airplanes flying offshore so the, uh, the, the thing I would focus on is control of the airspace, ISR, and using national means if you need to. I ended up working with NGA and their mapping people to give me products I could use to better understand what was going on. But it's to better understand the technology and the ISR that would be available. And thanks, Mike. And, and from my standpoint, uh, I, I doubt that as a Fibron commander, uh, there's much I, I would have changed um, you just got to be flexible, and that's part of what you learn to be uh, in the amphibious part of our Navy, especially. Um, I, I think that uh, practice always helps, and it would have been nice to have had some sort of drill or practice during our workups. Um, and if there's one thing I would have done it, at hindsight, uh, I would have uh, made contact with the Coast Guard, with FEMA, with you know, federal authority uh, to do the what-if drill. Um, once or before I, my group was designated as a ready duty ARG, um, just so at least I had something to start with, knowing things probably would change. Okay, well, I have the uh, next question is coming from Chief Eric Canero in Pensacola, Florida. With groups that have formed as the Cajun Navy and other groups like the Conk Republic, Navy, the Conk Republic Navy down in Key West, should the ICS system have a place for them? My suggestion would be those groups have a spot at the table like the police, fire, and Coast Guard. I know saying giving them a spot would add them to the bureaucracy, but keep them out of the bureaucracy as much as possible. Yeah, my answer would be yes, we need to do that. I think there have been huge strides taken in that direction. Uh, the real issue are two things. Number one, what are their qualifications and capability, and how do you integrate that in terms of uh, command and control and governance? And the second, in many cases, uh, there are security and safety requirements. Uh, in many cases, the volunteers that come in have to have HAZWOPER training to, to deal with the environment they're operating in. So subject to those two things, I'm in total agreement. The best way to do that is for these organizations to prepare ahead of time, have a, have a written documentation of their qualifications and certifications, and have a way to have an entry point into the discussion. It's easy to do that once you uh, once you get them organized, but you have to first vet them to make sure they're capable of doing what they're advertising because some people come in well intended and then make a mistake or fail to perform. In the case of the Cajun Navy, that's not the case. And the other, the other group that's doing really well after these disasters is Team Rubicon, which is a group of uh, US veterans uh, that come in and bring their skills that they've uh, gathered in their service time and apply that answer in my view unequivocally yes. Is there a mechanism in place uh, for these groups to be able to to, to uh, you know display uh, or at least present where their uh, standards or requirements are like to FEMA or to the Coast Guard or or whomever is there something in place right now that allows for that or is it something that has to be built later? Uh, there is a way to do that there, there's a national association of volunteer organizations that work in disasters uh, in VOAD that FEMA works with. And my counsel is always get organized, get in contact with these folks, get a list of requirements and establish proactive uh, agreements and trust 
and proactive relationships so that you can pull it trigger pretty quick when you need to but you really need to have some kind of a structure by which you bring these people in and fema has built that structure in my view since uh, katrina yeah i'm not sure about that cajun navy but i'll tell you what i do know a lot of those conk republic guys down there and you better check the sobriety a little bit too <laughs> but uh so i have a shout out here for i think uh both of you maybe michael moore formerly mayor's chief of staff in the city of houston just wanted to do a Shout out to y'all, and uh, and uh, I think he's just appreciating your leadership during what was, like I said, one of arguably one of the greatest disasters ever hit the United States. Well, let me say right now, he'd probably work for Mayor White, who I thought did an extraordinary job. The way that Houston opened their arms and doors and facilities and everything else it was absolutely extraordinary. Uh, the majority of people who left New Orleans went to Houston, and. Uh, at one point, we opened a disaster recovery office in Houston, and it was the largest one that FEMA had ever opened, and it wasn't where the disaster was. It was where the people had gone. So uh, I'll pass my, my, uh, my best back to Mayor White, who did an admirable job during the, during the crisis. Sounds good. We have a question from Jeff Smith. So Admiral Allen and I know all these guys. We must have, we got ringers. Ringers. <laughs> But it says, were there differences in D.C. political oversight between the Katrina and Deepwater responses? If so, how did it impact tasking on the ground? Uh, Jeff Smith was the Master Chief of the Reserve Force uh, when I was the Master Chief of the Coast Guard working for Admiral Allen. So that's the question, Admiral. The answer is yes. <laughs> uh, the, uh, the big difference between uh, Katrina and the Deepwater Horizon oil spill was in Katrina, uh, the protagonist was Mother Nature. And in Deepwater Horizon, uh, we had a responsible party, BP. Uh, it was uh, as midterm elections were approaching and almost every facet of the skill uh, of the spill was politicized. I spent my most, of t most of my time as a national incident commander uh, for Deepwater Horizon brokering uh, issues between the White House and BP's uh, board and CEO, uh, being responsive to questions on the Hill then managing the uh, respective uh, demands of the five governors of the five states that were threatened, and they were all Republican governors uh, with the Democratic administration. So you can imagine the, uh, the political machinations. Uh, we were polarized back then, much the same as we are now. And I thought most of the value that I added uh, was not in capping the well because we had some experts who were really working on that. I, I worked the interface between trying to free up the operators to do their jobs and uh, deal with the political issues that were going on and the communications with the public. But it was, uh, Deepwater Horizon was the most uh, uh, political event I've ever been involved in. And Admiral Harris, uh, so my son was on the Coast Guard Cutter Spencer, who pulled in probably right near the Iwo Jima during this, uh, during Katrina. And, uh, you know, he talked a lot. I mean, he, he thought that, uh, I mean, we, we, he's my son, he's over there. We were quite concerned about him because uh, this with this horrific disaster had happened. Uh, but I always really, really felt, I think reassured by the fact that our armed services, our Navy, our army, they were able to deploy pretty quickly and get over there and, uh, and get in, in, in action. Uh, do you think that that mechanism, I mean, the state's control, and I understand that the city's control uh, but, uh, and there has to be a request to the federal government. But do you think that there should be a mechanism in place to make it happen even more quickly? Or did you think that's, you know, just because our system of government is set up this way, that's the best we can do? What do you think? So I, I think that the, the mechanism is set up, um, and that mechanism is U.S. Northcom. That mechanism is uh, the interagency working group. And I think uh, as we've talked a little bit here already, um, because of the experiences that we have seen, uh, Katrina being one of them, uh, but there have been so many, uh, we're getting up practice uh, that, uh, we're, that uh, the folks are getting more and more uh, used to it. Um, you know, I, I, I don't know how much longer our conversation is going to go, so that's why I asked Bill to, to show just a few of my favorite uh, uh, photos from uh, the event, uh, uh, from our response. Um, but I tell you, there are three things that really 
have come to my mind when I think back uh, to Katrina, aside from the two great leaders you see right here before you, um, two different leaders, but two great leaders who probably never have worked together before or even met each other before uh, walking on their tarmac uh, to meet the president. Um, number one, it's an old lesson. It's amazing what can be accomplished when you don't care who gets the credit. I did not see a lot of credit grabbing at the leadership level or any place else. It was just, everybody was just trying to get the job done. Um, and it's amazing how we can get over our cultures, our differences, we can work together uh, in, in these type of things. Number two, simple is best when it comes to the mission statement, to the orders, uh, especially when you don't have time to train, you don't have uh, the resources allocated or fixed. Um, really simple mission orders. And I think the ones, again, Admiral Allen mentioned earlier, uh, my own comment to my group, they'd find the good and do it, um, work best. And a simpler organization, so you're not having to, to futz with a, an overly complicated or organization. Flat is best. And then the last thing is just the incredible pride that I feel to this day uh, when I think back to the work that was done by the individual sailors, Coast Guardsmen, uh, Marines, soldiers, airmen, government civilians, and, and our civilian um, uh, volunteers that were really working pretty seamlessly together um, to get the job done. And, and I'm sure uh, what I saw is something that also could be uh, attributed to other disasters, including the ones we're going through today. Yeah, I would just add, uh, I think Scott got right on the uh, NORTHCOM uh, role here. Uh, had NORTHCOM not been created after 9-11, we wouldn't have a standing body that could create a joint task force that we were able to put together for Katrina. And in the same manner, the U.S. Southern Command created a joint task force following the uh, earthquake in Haiti. Uh, I guess, I, in, in all honesty, I'm a little perplexed in the last few years, uh, starting with the Bahamas and some of the other, uh, and, and Puerto Rico mainly with Maria. Uh, I actually raised the notion with uh, senior leaders in the Pentagon and the, and the White House of why a, a task force wasn't created to unify the effort in those two places. Uh, I won't get into why or why it was or wasn't done, uh, but I'll just tell you the Joint Task Force under NORTHCOM or the Combatant Commander SOUTHCOM for Haiti is the way to go. Uh, the second issue is following Katrina, uh, they created a Council of Governors, uh, three Republican and three Democratic governors, of which um, the director of FEMA, uh, NORTHCOM commander, uh, myself were involved in, and they created a concept uh, to create a, a dual-hatted joint task force commander, uh, where the tag could be double-hatted as a joint task force commander if needed. Uh, I would really like to see that evolve, mature, and actually see that deployed at some point to see if it would work, where you can unify the Title 10 and the Title 32 forces under a single command. Yes, sir. So uh, in uh, Admiral Harris's photos there, I saw one that uh, President Bush and General Honore and you, Admiral Allen, and I, I can't help but uh, in any Katrina discussion, we've got to ask you, so uh, how did you get your first ride on Air Force One? Uh, that's a pretty interesting story, Skip. Uh, I, uh, I had done an overflight with uh, President Bush and Governor Perry from Texas over southwest Louisiana following the landfall of Hurricane Rita. Uh, we had gone back to the airport at Lake Charles and uh, I was walk I, I, my aide and I were gonna walk back over to a helicopter to take us to Baton Rouge and we were gonna try and get home for the first time uh, since we were deployed. Um, earlier in the day in the helicopter, the president asked me if I had a chance to get home and I told him I hadn't. And he asked me, well, where I plans to go home soon. I said, maybe this coming weekend. And I looked at him and kind of wryly said, if the president doesn't come. Because after a while, he was, it was a weekly visit. Um, and he assured me that he was not gonna come back the following weekend. Uh, on the tarmac, when my aide and I were walking to the helicopter to head back to Baton Rouge, uh, Joe Hagan, the deputy chief of staff of the White House, tapped me on the shoulder and I turned around and he said, the president wants you to fly back uh, to Washington on Air Force One with him. And all I remember was it was dark and it was cool and it was relaxing and we had lasagna. 
No, that's awesome. And, uh, you know, I just got a, uh, actually a text message from Captain Joe Ray retired. And he says, no Facebook for me. He's interested in comments on the use of social media by Coast Guard Academy cadets to develop heat mats, heat, heat mats, and identify survivors in need of assistance during Harvey. And he says, how do we build on this for future incidents? Yeah, we actually had a cadet uh, work uh, that during Harvey and he actually got a, he got, he got an award from the U.S. Naval Institute and was recognized for his work there. And uh, increase, it's a combination of two things, Skip. One is the, uh, the social media providing access and then be able to analyze the data. You know, everything, everything in our world is coming down to data analytics these days and taking the information you got and trying to, uh, trying to squeeze the value out of it. Uh, but these heat maps regarding, there's a lot of ways to look at it, whether or not you've lost power, uh, what's the situation with water and other critical supplies. Uh, and in the absence of people being able to actually say they've got a problem, you can actually create an indicator that you need to go respond to something because it's being generated by the social media. Uh, it's, it's something that it's being incorporated now. Uh, I don't have my hands on exactly how, where it's going, uh, but I know it's, it's absolutely mandatory in this, in this day of social media because you got an indicator of a problem you need to respond to and you need to be aware of it. Aye, aye. So, uh, uh, Vince, do you have another, another question? Yes, I do. I, you know, as we talk a lot about all of the people that have been involved, uh, particularly from federal, state, municipal, uh, the services and all, the, you know, there's just a lot of people that were really involved as well as people who were very significant. And I'd like to ask uh, you two gentlemen, uh, uh, who, who are those unsung heroes? There are, there's gotta be quite a few other people that we didn't hear about that were some of the greatest in the uh, behind the scenes type that uh, made things happen. Thank you, go first. All right, Admiral, uh, happy to do so. So um, I, I'm gonna miss, I'm sure, uh, a name, I'll be reminded afterwards, uh, why did you mention so-and-so, but uh, I got to give a big shout out to the COs um, uh, for the groups that uh, were working with me under uh, Admiral Booker, Nat under Admiral Kilkenny. Uh, Rich Callis, one of the greatest COs I've ever served with, incredible ship driver, incredible ship captain, navigating Iwo Jima up to the river walk. I think he had one and a half tug or something like that. And that big ship around, um, just and a great motivator. Uh, Nora Tyson, she was the first one on scene uh, with Batan uh, uh, that came up uh, on the coast and were providing early support to General Henry. And, and when I mention the names like Callis and Nora Tyson, I'm really talking about the whole ship, okay? Uh, and I'm sure they would too. Uh, Dave Pine, CONUS, Shreveport CO, uh, just providing great support, especially down in Lower Ninth Ward. Uh, Mark Scoville, Tortuga, um, great CEO and uh, was critical, uh, important when we had to respond to Rita uh, and I put him way up forward to give some early response in the camera. Uh, Cedric Pringle, Whidbey Island, who went and did it again in uh, uh, Hurricane Matthew, uh, another just great CEO uh, that uh, led. And then the group that nobody ever listens to or hears about or thinks about, the Beach Masters and the Beach Group, and Captain Frank Hewlett. Now, yeah, he, he, he was accused of trying to shoot down a Dutch helicopter. He did not shoot down the Dutch helicopter. He did not fire, he did not discharge his weapon, okay? But uh, he, he did try to get the thing to not land on one of the uh, craft that was coming uh, close to the beach. But Frank Hewlett and, and the Beach Masters, the Beach Group, the CBs, those folks, they did a phenomenal, a phenomenal job. And, and that's just from the Navy side. I haven't even mentioned the Marine Corps side, but those are some of the ones that come to my mind. Yeah, I guess in my mind, I would divide uh, into two groups. Uh, knowing that I got there a week after the storm came ashore, uh, for the initial response, uh, you, gotta, you gotta single out Bruce Jones, the commanding officer of Air Station New Orleans, and his incredible crew that were flying uh, like in two o'clock the afternoon after the storm came ashore, pulling people off of rooftops. Um, Frankie Paskowitz, who was a group commander in New Orleans, uh, the surface rescues. Uh, the majority of the 33,000 people that were saved in that first week uh, by the Coast Guard. At the heart of that, and the hardest hardest lift was uh, 
Bruce Jones's folks and Frankie Paskowitz's folks. Uh, Dave Callahan over at Air Station Mobile became the forward operating aviation support base for the entire operation. And I would single those three people out from the immediate operational response. Uh, when I got the call to go to the airport on the 5th of September, uh, I made three calls. The first one was to Tom Acton, who at that time was an 06 assigned to uh, uh, Daz DHD McHale's office in the Pentagon. Uh, he had been in charge of our uh, deployable boat operations in the land area when I was a commander on 9-11. Uh, so I called him. I called Adrian West, who ran my command center in uh, Atlantic area on 9-11. And uh, I called Ron Lebrecht, who was my public affairs officer in Miami when I was a district commander down there. Uh, and I, I, I said the same thing to all three of them. Uh, find me in New Orleans tomorrow. Uh, I didn't ask their commands. Uh, I didn't give them any uh, travel order numbers. I didn't give them any logistics. I just said, I need you to be there. And I think it's been pretty much known throughout the Coast Guard. Uh, sometimes you need some myths and legends to kind of reinforce people's morale and stories allow you to pass this stuff down through generations. And I called all those people the dogs that hunt and still, still do today. Extraordinary people. And then my, my military aide, Katrina Harper, about a six-month-old son and deployed with me for six months while her husband, who was a former classmate at the Coast Guard Academy, uh, took care of their kid. That's extraordinary dedication all the way around, and I thank them all. all right, great. And and I like know there's many. Real quickly, uh, because we talked at the, the focus of this discussion has been the federal response, Department of Defense, Coast Guard, uh, but we also, and, and DHS, but I'd like to just say, after having lived several years on that Gulf Coast, I think that the people themselves were amazingly resilient in this. It was really, really a difficult situation. I'm not sure people were really prepared initially for what happened, but they came together afterwards. And uh, as exemplified, I think, when I, I still go in Mother's Restaurant whenever I'm in New Orleans and I see that picture of Admiral Allen hanging there. And... Uh, I think the folks did come together in, in an amazing way all along that Gulf Coast. Uh, how, how do you feel about the people in New Orleans and Mississippi and all the impacted regions, Admiral Allen and Admiral Harris? I'd say um, I, I'd make a distinction. I think the, the area of New Orleans uh, in and around New Orleans was impacted by the flooding. It was actually driven by storm surge and the water in Lake Pontchartrain created a different situation uh, than we had in Mississippi and then what we had in the southwest Louisiana during Hurricane Rita. Everything was awful. Uh, debris, lines down, uh, lack of access, lack of potable water, everything. Uh, but the problem in New Orleans with the flooding and the city being underwater uh, made it uh, an order of magnitude and scale that was absolutely extraordinary. And the other thing is, and I've said this a lot, um, if you have underserved communities, and you have chronic stressors in an area where you have lack of transportation, all these other things. Um, the event doesn't cause those events, those, those situations, but the consequences of the event are exacerbated by these chronic conditions that, uh, that uh, pre-exist prior to the event. And I think sooner or later we're going to have to come to grips with the uh, inequities of how our cities are designed and these underserved communities and how they're impacted. And I think we're seeing that right now during COVID-19 as well. Uh, but for the rest of it, the, the, the resiliency on the, on the Mississippi coast and southwest Louisiana, just as you said, Skip. Yes, sir. So a, when we arrived on uh, Biloxi Beach, there was a, um, an older uh, lady, gray hair, blue eyed, sitting on two bags in front of what was her house of, I want to say, 40 or 50 years. That was gone. Only the foundation. Um, I, I got off the craft. I was, you know, heading to the beach. I see her and I went up, just asked, ma'am, can we help you? Uh, anything to do for you? Uh, no, I'm waiting for my daughter. Uh, eventually she's going to come get me from wherever it was. Uh, what can I do for you all? What can I do for you? All? And, and so the human spirit, the American spirit, uh, that I saw, uh, of, of neighbors that were helping neighbors. Um, care for others. Uh, I, I saw that come true as well. And, and that is, is one of the, my other takeaways from my experience of, of seeing uh, how we 
uh, resolve these things or how, how resilient American people are. And, and, and what we're seeing today is the same with COVID-19. Uh, I mean, there's no way to describe how horrific this has been and certainly not equitable across all socioeconomic or racial uh, groups. Uh, but you also see people helping in every way they can uh, to make it through this, to make it through the fires in the West and make it through the unrest in, in our cities. Um, so that is, th those are things that you really have to hold on to and, and find ways to uh, encourage, um, to help that resiliency uh, of our people. I agree, sir. You know, I've been in a lot of difficult situations in the last 40 years. Uh, a lot of uh, disaster scenes, not quite like Katrina. I, I tried to get to Katrina, but they wouldn't let me. But the, uh, that's another story. But the thing is, is, uh, you know, uh, when people come together and help other people, I mean, I, all that other stuff goes away and people just, I mean, it, it, that's, that's where it's at as far as I'm concerned. So any last words for my co-host Vince, uh, Vince Patton, or the two admirals? Uh, we're almost out of time. Well, I'm gonna, I'm gonna give it to the admirals. I'd, I'd like to hear their, their final words. Well, I'll, defer to, I'll defer to Singh to go first. <laughs> okay, because I was gonna say, you should give the last word. Um, hey, 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 gents, thank you uh, for allowing me to have a chance to be again with my shipmate, uh, Admiral Thad Allen. Um, I had never met the gentleman before, but huge respect, and it's been an honor. It was an honor to serve with him then. It's an honor to know him now, um, and and it really expanded my mind in terms of working uh, with the Coast Guard, which I had never done um, up to that point, and, but I've done a number of times since then. Um, it was a horrible event, uh, but it, it brought together our force in ways that uh, made us stronger and better and, and able to now address any number of these events going in the future. Thank you for the opportunity to share uh, with the heroes of uh, Katrina and Rita. Thank you, sir. Yeah, I would, uh, I would foot stomp uh, Sink's comments. Um, it's extraordinary when you bring people together and they subordinate the parochial interest uh, to a greater good and I, part of the reason everything worked the way it did in New Orleans was that's what everybody did. Now, there were characters, you know, and I sometimes I had to manage what I called the Ross Honoré's collateral, uh, collateral goodness, not damage. Kind of had to tell them that, you know, there, there's a, you had to go talk to the state if you're going to mess with the cattle in Cameron Parish and talk to the Department of Agriculture. Uh, but in the end, everybody was trying to do something good, as, as Sink said earlier. And while we're not always perfect, and there are things we can do better the next time around, I think a uh, trademark of Coast Guard operations is related to our ethos and the ingrained innate feeling we have to serve humanity and save people. And we're able to overcome uh, problems and adversity by doing that. And I've come to believe that in the end, uh, we are redeemed by our mission. And whatever problems we have, the mission pulls it out of us and allows us to be able to optimize what we can do for ourselves and the American public. Yes, thank sir. You, sir. Admirals, thanks again for joining us on this uh, this session of Surface Navy Associations continuing the conversation. Again, for those that have been watching, please go to www.navysna.org. Don't let the name throw you. It does include the U.S. Coast Guard, and it is a great organization. We need your support. We need members. So again, Admiral Allen and Admiral Harris and Vince Patton, thanks again for joining us. And uh, we're looking forward to some upcoming sessions. We've got one in mind, for, you know, we'll talk about the Coast Guard Academy and what's going on there. Uh, we'll talk about, as far as the Coast Guard goes, we have some ongoing uh, sea duty attractiveness. Uh, I'm gonna try to talk SNA into talking about that next, next month. But uh, pretty excited about all this. And uh, I, with that, uh, Captain Erickson, if you can sign us out, we'll be, uh, we'll be seeing you next time. Thank you. Bye, everybody.